It's, uh, our next guest is Dr. Ruth Heydrich. Uh, when, when I was planning this conference, um, well before that, um, I was asked, I think Doug, people that should be on Organic Athletes Sort of Health and Nutrition Committee, who he thought should be on it. And the first name he, he came up with was, was Ruth Heydrich. And I'd heard about Ruth, and I was like, wow, that'd be great. So I emailed her, and it was like within five minutes, I got an email back, and she was like, yes. And I was like, wow, OK. Uh, and then I told her we're having this conference, and you know, I think before I even asked, it was like, yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, you know, we wanted somebody to talk about what it takes to be vegan in the long term. Um, you know, you hear a lot of stories of people who have gone vegan or gone vegetarian, and they, they stay that way for a couple years, and then it just doesn't work out for whatever reason. Ruth has been vegan for 23 years. She's a tremendous athlete. She's won 900 now. She's going for 1,000 gold medals in, uh, in running in triathlons. And um, we serve on, on VUNA together. We're both counselors on the Vegetarian Union of North America. So that's been an honor to work with, with her. I was very pleased to, to begin working with her. So I'm going to hand it over to her and let her talk about long-term vegan success. Yeah. Great. So Thank you, Brad. Okay, you ready? <laughs> first of all, I want to thank Bradley for putting this on. The inaugural first ever Organic Athletes Forum. That's, that's great. <laughs> because we've got so much good information that we want to spread to a lot of other people. And it's a challenge, I'm sure you all know, if not for yourself, certainly trying to convince other people. I'm going to have to tell, tell my story, how I got to where I am today, because I did not just wake up one morning and say, I think I'll become a runner. Or another morning, I think I'll become a vegan. Or, the biggest one of all for me, I think I'll do the Ironman triathlon. <laughs> Didn't work that way at all with none of the three. What happened back in 1968 and Doug's already referred to one of my idols, Dr. Kenneth Cooper. Cooper coined the word aerobics in 1968, published a book, which I just happened to come across. I was walking past the newsstand, and here's this paperback, aerobics. I had never seen the word before, and I'm thinking, what? I've got to find out what this word means. So I picked it up, started thumbing through, and it was about running and how it helped every part of the body from head to toe. And I had problems at that time, every part of me from head to toe. And I was only 33 then. Are the calculators going? <laughs> how old is she? <laughs> well, <laughs> save you the time. I am 70 years of age <laughs> and happy to be here and I'm going for a lot more and, and really want to promote athleticism for our senior citizens and seniors in running is anybody over 40. So if you're not there yet, you'll be there in a blink, believe me. <laughs> it happens very quickly. Picked up this book, Aerobics, and read it in one sitting. It was so fascinating. Put it down about 2 o'clock in the morning and thought, I am going to go try this running, 1968, remember? Mm -hmm. This was when, if you, anybody was caught running, they were sure they were being chased by the police <laughs> <laughs> or uh, something really strange because when I started running, people would look at me and I'd get these weird, sometimes cars, I'm, I know they'd come right at me. But what I decided I'd better do is run first thing in the morning. So I'd get up when it was still dark sometimes and just started running one day after another and found that I enjoyed it. I enjoyed getting out, looking at the morning. It gave me more energy. I started feeling better. I started sleeping better. Uh, the head cleared, the flat feet went, and every part in between started getting better. So I thought, this is really neat. So from 1968, to about 1974, I was just doing my early morning run for an hour. 
One day, somebody said to me, you know, they've got a 10K race. Why don't you enter it? I had never thought about doing a race. Huh, I wonder. Gee, maybe, yeah, I'm going to do it. So I signed up for it. Get up there to the start line. Look around. I'm the only woman. <laughs> They're all men. 1974. This was way before uh, the big running boom and even women. So, guess who won their first gold medal? <laughs> and I was hooked. I, I came home with that, put it on my dresser, looked at it every morning and thought, this, wonder where the more races are. <laughs> Started looking around and because of my training, you know, not really realizing what I was doing, I was training every morning. Um, just Anyway, that's the running part. So again, I didn't wake up deciding to be a runner. I got educated and found out that there are some really good things that happen to your body when you exercise it properly. Now, deciding to become a vegan one morning, well, that didn't quite happen that way either. I had been running 14 years, had been running races and doing pretty well feeling like the fittest person I knew, and I'm sure I was, <laughs> because I'd had this habit going. It's just get up in the morning, put on running shoes out the door, and you run. Uh, no, should I, or will I, or whatever. You, I just did it just as routinely as everything else you do in the morning. Fourteen years later, I find a lump in my breast right here. Go to the doctor. And the doctor says, well, I don't think it's anything to worry about. Lots of women have cysts in their breasts. This is from eating animal foods, by the way, but he didn't know that. I didn't know that. Uh, he said, let's do a mammogram. The mammogram came back negative. So he says, see, nothing to worry about. Come back in six months and we'll check it out. So I did as I was supposed to and came back and I thought it was larger. but." He didn't think so. He said, no, I don't think it's anything to worry about. Long story short, three years later, I'm in the doctor's office. I know this time it is larger because when I'm lying down, it is standing up like that. So I'm on the examining table and this new doctor walks in. My medical records in his arm like this, he walks in, puts the sheet back and says, oh my God, why did you wait so long to come in? And I just panicked. I thought, here I've been doing everything that I thought I should be doing, running, being really healthy. I thought I was eating right. I had given up red meat years before and was eating chicken and fish and low-fat dairy, you know that story, and <laughs> thought, <laughs> thought I was really healthy. And how could my body have betrayed me this way? He got me up off the table, took me by the elbow, and marched me down to the appointment desk and said, schedule this lady for surgery ASAP. So that was uh, quite a shock, as you can well imagine. I was then 47 years old, thinking I am way too young to die. Although I did look at 50 around the corner, thinking, well, life's over with at 50, right? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you're too young to uh, really get it. But when you're 40-something <laughs> and you think, you. You remember your grandparents in their 50s and 60s? You're thinking, they're really old. I know with mine, I did not want to be like my grand, both grandmothers, you know, had bodies like this and, and like this, <laughs> and just uh, <laughs> run, grand, my grandparents run, my parents. I mean, this, this was so different and I had envisioned my life from here on out was going to be so different because I was into sports. And then this breast cancer thing comes along and think, my God, what happened? Well, I had the surgery. The tumor was the size of a golf ball. It had spread to one lung and my bones. And some of the doctors said, because I went to a bunch of them, saying, how could I have been so healthy? How could I have cancer that spread through my body? And they said, we don't know uh, what causes cancer. They didn't tell me that it doesn't happen in other countries that don't eat the way we do. <laughs> um, they did say that, well, exercising is good and it shouldn't have happened to you. And I'm saying, well, yeah, it did. Why? So I started doing some investigation. Why? Because I was doing everything right. 
went to see the third, fourth, fifth doctor. The seventh doctor I went to see was John McDougall. Anybody heard of John McDougall? <laughs> Some of you haven't, right? You have not heard of John McDougall? Well, he practices in Santa Rosa right now, but back then he practiced in Oahu, in Kailua, Oahu, on the Hawaiian Islands, which is where I lived at the time, which was so fortunate for me. Because I had just gotten out of the hospital, saw this newspaper ad, literally a two-liner, still have it, says, wanted women who have or have had breast cancer to participate in diet research study. I thought, perfect. I was already a graduate student. I was well on my, in fact, all but the dissertation to a PhD in psychology. So I knew research study, boy, that's what I want to do. So I called him up and got right through. How many times do you call a doctor's office and the doctor <laughs> answers? You know, that never happened. He said, get your medical records and come over to the office as soon as you can. He greets me at the door and I'm thinking, this is no ordinary doctor. Sits me down, two hours later, I'm a vegan. That's how quickly I made the change. <laughs> and it was a matter of education. He said, the reason you got breast cancer is because of the hormones in the animal foods overstimulate the breast cells and with your high fat diet. And I said, Not, no high fat, chicken and fish. With your high fat diet. <laughs> you know, um, so what you need to do is go on a low fat vegan diet. And I just said, that's it. Signed up for the study and he published the results in a medical journal about four years later. And I guess that might have helped with the discipline, although I really don't think so, because I said two hours, so I had brown rice and a baked potato and, some, and a big salad for supper that night. The next morning when I got up, something happened that I was really unaccustomed to. I had been constipated my whole life. I didn't know it. In fact, I'd been told by a number of doctors that going three or four times a week is normal for some people. <laughs> and I, boy, <laughs> is he wrong about that? Because I then found out what normal was. I was getting enough fiber, finally. So this was one benefit that I saw immediately. I mean, just the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And, and boy, that solved one problem. And by the way, um, I have a grandmother that died of colon cancer. So I was headed right for colon cancer after the breast cancer. Doctors would tell you the two kind of go together. Well, same cause, obviously. So do a lot of other diseases. So again, I didn't wake up saying, I think I'll become a vegan today. That's how that happened. The Iron Man, okay. Notice my uniform, this, this is my very first one. Really happy with it because it, on the back it says what these distances are. You know, a two and a half, 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, and a marathon. Well, I had not gone back to work after the surgery, and so I had time. I still had the drains and sutures in. I started the vegan diet. And I'm doing some channel surfing, run through the TV, and I just happened upon the ABC Wide World of Sports. And I see this event going on. And remember, I'm already hooked on running races. So I see these young, fit bodies doing the swim. Well, this is, I'm already in Hawaii, so you know, this is <laughs> right here in my backyard. And I knew how to swim because I learned about the same time I learned how to walk, but I hadn't done any real swimming for years. But I thought, oh, I can do that. And then they jumped on their bikes and they biked 112 miles. So I thought, that's nothing compared to running. You're sitting the whole time, right? And you just turn your legs around. <laughs> yeah, I, I can do that. Piece, piece of cake. The hardest part, obviously, is a marathon. Well, by this time, I've got to tell you, I'd run, I think it was four marathons. So, and I, you know, knew that was very doable. So I threw in, in addition to my every morning run, I started adding the swimming and the biking. And I started feeling more fit and stronger and thought, I'm gonna beat the cancer. I am also going to do the Ironman. And then I thought, wait a minute, lady. Cancer patients don't do Ironman triathlons. <laughs> and then I thought, I'm going to be the first cancer patient to ever do the Ironman. 
Then I thought, lady, you're 47 years old. You know, that's, <laughs> these are all young people, 20s and 30s, who are doing the Iron Man. Then I thought, well, I'll be the oldest <laughs> woman, the oldest female cancer <laughs> woman doing the Iron Man. So that was my goal. I started training, and that it just kind of fed itself. The more I did, the fitter I felt. I felt strong. I'd get a little depressed thinking, why me? Why the breast cancer? And, and is it going to kill me within weeks, months, maybe years if I'm lucky? I'd go for a run and a swim or a swim and a bike and, and come back thinking, oh my God, I am so lucky to be alive. It was just the opposite from the way I felt before. The exercise was important, but here's a, a lesson here. It's not enough. I was a marathoner, still got breast cancer. So I became a vegan triathlete. In fact, I have baseball cards. I have enough for everybody, so if you want one, mm -hmm. they're just like regular baseball cards, except there's a picture of me across the finish line of the Iron Man. It says, vegan triathlete. And this is the message that I'm trying to get to everybody. This is the way to have exercise be fun, be competitive, because what I found, I don't know about you, but the best way for me to push myself is line me up at the star line, have the gun go, and see who wins. <laughs> I've always been a little bit competitive, and still to this day, you know, <laughs> um, it's fun. Now, in terms of advantages, recovery, uh, so many races, 900, as Bradley said, and I'm going for more. Um, how do you get that many races? Well, Doug Graham mentioned this morning, people train, don't train, they just compete all the time. I didn't quite do that. I trained every day, but I entered as many races as I could, as many as I heard about. I went everywhere. Um, I ran the Great Wall of China, I've done the Moscow Marathon, I've done Boston, I've done New York City, total of 67 marathons. But at this point I was still training for the Ironman. So I did things like the Run to the Sun. Has anybody heard of this race? It's on Maui, 37 miles, start at sea level in Kahalui, and you go up to 10,200 feet. And that was one of my training runs because I thought if I can do 37 miles at a stretch, surely that's going to help me. And this was two months before my first Ironman. So I took off running and it's getting steeper and the air is getting thinner and I'm starting to labor and think, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can do this. Got to an aid station and it turned out to be the 26 mile point and I was getting some water and looked down and way down there I could see the beach down at Kahalui, and here I'd come. I thought, these legs have brought me 26 miles to here. I was so proud of myself. I've already done a marathon. Then I looked up here, <laughs> 10 <laughs> more miles, and they were almost straight up, and I thought, oh my God. Then I said, lady, if you think this is tough, just wait till the Iron Man. And that just energized me. It just got me going again. <laughs> Crossed the finish line, and guess what? Another gold medal. <laughs> There weren't a lot of women in their forward, late 40s, and um, that is one of the reasons why I did so well. But not always. There are some that I really had to bust my butt to, to get across the finish line before they did. And it just makes, made me stronger. Looking for other races, well, there was, um, I remember one time, Alamoana Park, there was a state championship 5K. And here I was um, going for state records because they were so soft. I mean, most women thought running, uh, how many of you remember back a few years ago, they told women not to run because their uteruses would fall out? <laughs> well, literally, one medical doctor thought that that's what would happen. And then all the rest thought that running was going to wear out your knees, that that cartilage from running was going to destroy knees. So there weren't a lot of, of people, women, especially older women, running. So I was going to set a new 5K record at Alamoana Beach Park, and that race started at 7. Well, there was a triathlon in Kailua on the other side of the island that started at 8. And I thought, wow, what training for the Ironman. What I'm going to do is <laughs> do the 5K starting at 7 o'clock. I'll be through by 20 minutes after. Park the car right by the finish line. I'll have them hold my gold medal, right? <laughs> I'll pick it up later and jumped in the car 
and went across the poly and I'd already told the race director of the triathlon that uh, what I was going to do. I'd even thought about hiring a helicopter, <laughs> get from one, and I thought, no, if I finish by 20 after, which I knew I could, and drive across 20 minutes to the Kailua site, um, I'm already in running clothes and, you know, the bike's in the trunk of the car, I can make it. But the race director said, don't worry, if you're not here, I'll find a reason to delay the start until you get here. I thought, wow, this is really neat. Didn't need to do that, got there, and here I'm doing two races in one day. One weekend, I did three race races in one day. Um, one, let's see, did three marathons in three weeks, uh, really going guns. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is because with a vegan diet, the recovery is so fast. I, I was ready within hours to go again, whatever it was, training. If it was just a run, I knew I still had to bike and swim that day. And if it had done a triathlon one day, I was ready to, to do the full thing the next day. In fact, with the Ironman, I remember having done the Ironman in Japan. And anybody here been around long enough to remember Julie Moss and Scott Tinley, those people? Yeah, great. Well, they were there in Japan doing the Iron Man with me. And we were a few of the, several of the few Americans. So we kind of hung out together, ate together, because none of us spoke much Japanese. <laughs> and I, of course, I was the only vegan, unfortunately. But it was kind of neat being with these great triathlon pros. We did the Iron Man. I had a first place in my age group by a full hour and felt great afterwards. In fact, the next morning, I got up and went down, it was having breakfast, and I was trying to get somebody to get on the bus and go to Kyoto, because I wanted to visit the temples and Deer Park, and real nice, I mean, the opportunity to visit Kyoto, the ancient capital of Japan. They were all so tired, so sore, I couldn't get anybody to go with me. <laughs> I thought, this, you know, these are youngsters. How come they're, they're beat? Well, may, obviously you didn't race hard enough. Well, I think I did. But anyway, I got on the bus, and here I'm all by myself, uh, this two-hour drive from Hikone to where the Iron Man still is, to Kyoto. And I'm looking around. The only, uh, in Hawaiian we say haole, it means, <laughs> you know, white person. Um, on the bus, the rest are all Japanese, and nobody to talk to, and I'm looking at the scenery after a while. And I see this rolled up newspaper in the pocket, in the seat in front of me. And I thought, it's all Japanese. I can't read Japanese. No point in looking at that. And I thought, maybe they have a th some pictures. So I open it up, and there, oh my god, there's me <laughs> in, the, the, in the paper picture of me right after finishing the Iron Man. And I let out this yelp. And everybody in the bus, of course, is looking at me. The guy sitting right here says, I'm a professor of English at Kyoto University. Let, what does it say? And so he's, I said, that's me. I just did the Iron Man yesterday and got a first in my age group. And the article wrote, wrote up said, you know, American woman, 54, uh, does Iron Man, uh, no, conquers Iron Man, conquers cancer. And of course, in Japan, cancer is a real big, you know, scary thing. So he stands up reads the whole article to everybody on the bus, and I'm thinking, I'm in a movie. This is just, I can't believe this is happening. I'm alone. Nobody's going to believe me when I tell them the, the extraordinary circumstances that this came about. So is that going to lead to positive reinforcement? Right, yeah. <laughs> oh, I can do more of this. Um, I did the Iron Man in New Zealand. Well, back up just a bit. I got right after one of the Ironmans in Kona, I got a call from Continental Airlines. And this is the sports promotion director. He said, how would you like to be sponsored by Continental Airlines? And I go, oh my god. Sponsor? He said, yeah, they have an Ironman in, in New Zealand, don't they? And I said, yeah. He said, all right, we'll sponsor you. You wear Continental Airlines logo all over you and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll fly you there. I thought, this is incredible. So I'm flying down and get to New Zealand and because I'm so 
I know the diet is so important. I offer to give some talks while I'm down there. So they've got me the week before the Ironman, I'm giving all these talks and thinking, I should be resting, I should be tapering, I should be taking it easy. I've got to do well in this. It's a championship, world, you know, as they say, world championship. But I couldn't pass up this opportunity, so I'm talking to all these people. The next day, I'm doing the Ironman and cross the finish line, look back and see where second place is. Where's Because I knew who he, she was, another American lady, Joyce. I said, where's Joyce? Oh, she's a half an hour back. <laughs> so I said, oh, good, okay. So <laughs> then the newspaper, because the publicity, the New Zealand Cancer Society had done a bunch of publicity on my talk, so all the media was there. So as I'm crossing the finish line, there are all these flash bulbs going, <laughs> just like this. And the reporters all ask me questions. I have a host who's the translator for me. And I'm doing all these interviews and I'm thinking, my God, this is incredible. You know, what have I latched on to? This is amazing, amazing experience. The next morning, I go to get the results of the, you know, printed in the newspaper, New Zealand Herald. There's only one newspaper in, in New Zealand. And I take that home. And I wanted to take a bunch of copies home. So I walk to the convenience store across from where I'm staying, and there's a stack of newspapers. It's a Sunday paper, and it's this high. And there's my face on the cover. The picture is this big, and the headline, two inches high, Ruth, a woman of iron. And oh, I thought, oh my God, this is amazing. Just, I mean, just again, like being in a movie. Couldn't really believe this was happening. Uh, the recovery part of it, well, same thing. I said, okay, who wants to go do something today? <laughs> They're all, you know, walking stiff-legged like this, going upstairs backwards, and I'm, I'm feeling fine. And I said, uh, gosh, you know, we're here in New Zealand. Let's, let's explore the country. And so I get on the bus to go to Rotorua. Anybody been to Rotorua? It's beautiful. I go for a run. This is the next day. I'm totally recovered. <laughs> Going for a run, come around the bend, and I see these geysers shooting. It's just like another world, like being on another planet. And I think, I am so lucky. And in a way, you know, kind of owe it to cancer because I never would have been here, done that without that motivation. And then I got back to the motel where I was staying after this run, and the, the lady says, um, you know, they've got whitewater rafting that, that you can do this <laughs> afternoon. I said, oh, I've never done that. So here I am, the day after the Ironman, doing whitewater rafting, <laughs> and, this, and everybody else is just kind of, you know, as I said, not quite recovered. And I say, it's the vegan diet. You know, if you're eating plant foods, fruits and vegetables, you recover quickly. Um, so that kind of is what brought me to where I am today. Some of the questions people have about staying on a vegan diet, I had the, the medical gun to my head. I knew that I had to stick with the diet, did not find it difficult at all, found the foods, plant foods, so tasty, thought, how come I never tasted this good food before? It is really delicious, had no problem with it. Lost some weight, I was never overweight. Uh, I was probably about 125 pounds at the time of the cancer. Uh, went down to 117 because of, I guess, the anxiety of, of the cancer diagnosis and the new diet. And then just gradually went back up to 125, which is where I've been for 23 years, pretty much. Um, I don't consciously do a lot of weighing. I don't count calories. I don't count fat grams. I don't count cholesterol. Don't count a lot of things. I kind of let my appetite be my guide. I eat lots of fruits and vegetables, raw. I've been raw now for about five, six years. Uh, it, I'm not a, a religious fanatic about it. I have. Um, I make exceptions, hopefully fewer after this conference, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> on the way home. Right, Bob? We're going <laughs> to be a little more strict on the, the raw foods. Um, let's see, what are the other objections that people have had problems with? Lo losing weight, that, that'll normalize after a while because what most people need to do is just eat more. And isn't that fun? It tells <laughs> somebody, oh, you just have to eat more. And in terms of um, energy, uh, I had 
energy to burn. I always have energy to burn. I have trouble going to sleep at night, calming myself down, being too tired. Um, wake up most of the time just ready to go for a run, regardless of what's going on. I bike an hour a day. I probably do a, in Hawaii when I have my usual routine, I'm not traveling, I do a mini triathlon every day. Because if I skip one of those, uh, it feels, you know, like juggling. You have the three balls in the air. If you let that one go, you got to catch it. And then another one, you got to catch that one, and another one. And so I'm doing two or three hours of exercise a day because I love it. And I'm eating raw fruits and vegetables because I love them. So for somebody to say, how do you do that? Where do you find the discipline? You'd have to hold a gun to my head to make me eat animals. Um, after the change in diet had taken place for a couple of years, I started thinking about the animal rights, became sensitive to the plight of animals. And so running out in the country and seeing a cow, you know, I wanted to hug him, you know, and talk to him. I see birds and I talk to them. Um, we have Patrick in the Veg Society of Hawaii who, who brings a chicken to the meetings because he wants people to pet the chicken and, and see it for what it is, a loving creature, not food for people. Um, any other objections? I can't think of any. I, let me open it up to any questions. I think I'm, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I'd much rather this be interactive if I could answer questions or um, anything. Yes? Did you go through chemotherapy as well? Or? I'm glad you asked that. Yeah. No. Um, I, no chemo, no radiation. That was a condition of entering Dr. McDougall's study. He wanted to say, see, it's the diet that made the difference and not the chemo and the radiation. And I was so relieved. How was the diet different um, compared to a raw diet? What was your raw diet then? Then it was a lot of oatmeal and uh, baked potatoes and brown rice. Was the main difference and cooked vegetables. Um, they still had a lot of raw fruit. Um, gradually um, started leaning more and more. Well, I have to say, Doug's book, um, Doug Graham, uh, Grain Damage, made a big difference, and I started educating myself in terms of what grains did to me, and so I gave those up. And in terms of making changes in your, your life, education is so important. If you understand what's going on in the body, it's much easier to, to keep on the, the path that you want to set out for yourself. Who knows what the number one cause of death is in this country? Anybody? Ignorance. 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 <laughs> Caught you. Because if you get the information, you're going to prevent heart disease, cancer, uh, diabetes, stroke, osteoporosis, arthritis. I could spend an hour on each one of those diseases and show you how eating animal products causes one grand disease. And these are just all the side effects that, that we're inflicting on ourselves. Um, so you have to get educated first, get rid of that ignorance. Then you have to make a choice. Every day you have choices. You can eat this or you can eat that. And that choice becomes a decision that you make. I'm going to decide this is my choice and it's going to be plant foods. And then you have the commitment. You stick to it and say, that's it. It's not like it with my starting to run every morning. There was no should I or maybe or if. It was a given. You just do it. By the way, does everybody know that Nike was female? She was a goddess. <laughs> I found that out and I thought, yay, all right. <laughs> Nike is female, feminine. So after uh, the education, the, the choice, the decision, the commitment, what keeps me going are the results. Seeing as I, when I hit 60, you know, I remember I told you I thought 50 was the end. Well, I found 50s were fabulous. I was traveling all over the world doing all these great things and written up in newspapers and all that. But I knew that when I hit 60, that was payback time. That was when I was really old. 
Well, <laughs> I hit 60, and I was actually thinking about writing a book called Sexy 60s, because I thought, wow, it's not over with. It is still going strong. And I've got to tell people, yeah, this is how you do it. You've got to eat right, and you've got to exercise right. And then when I was looking at 70, I thought, well, for sure, now 70 is the end. Well, it's not yet anyway. I'm 70 and a half. I'll be 71 in February and thinking, you know, maybe I was wrong about, since I was wrong about all those other decades, maybe the mm -hmm. 70s will be just as good. Mm -hmm. So I've written a couple of books, uh, Race for Life, which that title was, is so meaningful to me on several different levels. I was racing for my life, but the Iron Man kind of became a, a epitome of my race for life. Um, we're all in a race for life. We just don't always know it. We're all starting at this start line and the gun goes off and some of us aren't going to make it because of ignorance. And in fact, it was Dr. John McDougall who kept saying, I guess it was after my first or second Ironman, he said, you have got to write a book. You have got to tell people what I try to tell them, but they won't listen and here you're living it. So that's when I wrote A Race for Life and that's out there. And then um, a year and a half ago, Martin Rowe, who's the, one of the founders of Lantern Books, said, why don't you write a book on elder fitness? Well, elder, as Ross can probably tell you, elder is the same as in England as we have senior here. And I thought, elder, <laughs> you know, that's kind of a strange name. I said, how about senior fitness? And he said, oh yeah, okay. So senior mm -hmm. fitness just came out this year. And I have a chapter on each one of the top 10 killers of Americans and how each one of those diseases is affected by diet and exercise. They're both so important. You can't have one without the other. I go through the top 10 drugs that most Americans are on, prescription and non-prescription drugs. You go through the pharmacy and you look at uh, this array of drugs that people can buy. <laughs> it's incredible. From acne medications to zinc, that's, uh, zits, the same thing. Everything in between, heartburn is from eating animal products, constipation I already told you about, arthritis. My arthritis disappeared. I'd been on arthritis medication for years at the time of the change in diet. Dr. McDougall says, stop that drug. You don't need it anymore. And he was right. Um, whatever medication, there's usually a reason for not having to take it by changing your diet and exercise. Okay, any more questions? I've started off again. Yes? Do you uh, supplement with anything? And also, what uh, do you eat before you, in the morning, do you eat breakfast? Okay, two, qu two in one questions. Do I supplement with anything? Um, B12 is the, the one thing that I've been watching. I didn't need any kind of supplement before. In fact, when I went in to see McDougal, you fill out history, you know, all your illnesses, sicknesses, drugs you're on. I wasn't on any drugs other than the arthritis medication, uh, which is very similar to Biox. It does the same thing to my body. But I had the list of supplements this long. I was taking everything, along with, you know, having switched to chicken and fish, thinking I'm doing the best thing. He looked at that list and he says, my God, why are you taking all these? And I said, I was just trying to be healthy. He said, stop them all. You don't need anything. B12 was this, the special case. Um, and I monitored my B12 for 18 years. My B12 levels were fine. Then they started dropping. So I supplement with um, nutritional, Red Star Nutritional Yeast and still monitor. I'm not sure that's the best way to do it. Sometimes just pop a B12 pill, but this probably long term. Do I eat anything before? No, <laughs> I can't. For some reason, if I eat first, anything first, it just kind of sits there, a big heavy lump in my stomach. I best when I wake up, do the evacuation, and then I really feel lean and mean and strong, and I can go I timed it pretty much two hours and 20 minutes before running out of glycogen. You remember the lecture from this morning, glycogen, it's stored in the muscle, the liver, and the bloodstream. That's the limit. And so something like an Ironman obviously takes a lot longer than that. And that's when I will start eating. During a race, I will eat what's on the course as long as it's vegan. It's usually bananas and apples. 
And for the long bike ride, again, uh, you can tuck apples under the saddle. Um, mm -hmm. uh, let's see, what else? That's about it. I keep going on fruit. And after the two hour, two to three hours of exercise, then I start getting hungry. So, okay, any other? Yes? Are you aware of any studies uh, that it's not just the diet, but genetics? Genetics. Um, I'm aware that there are genetic variations among all of us. We all have slightly different DNAs. On average, we all have the same DNA. We all, how many times has a surgeon opened us up and been surprised at what we see? Not very often. Everything is fairly predictable. We have our lab tests within this range of high and low, and we all fall within that. Very few exceptions. What we do have is the expression of genes. Like, I think every one of us would get arthritis if we ate animal products long enough. We would all have heart disease sooner or later, all of us, by eating animal foods. Uh, sometimes you get one before the other. I got the heart, the cancer first, but I would have eventually had heart disease because Dr. McDougall, when he looked at my medical records, he said, you know, with a high cholesterol like this, you are at as great a risk of dying of a heart attack as you are the cancer. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm a marathoner, for God's sake. And yet I had a high cholesterol, and that's thank you, chicken and fish, for doing that for me. So the genetic is something we can't do anything about. You just, if you're eating the way we're talking about, raw vegan, and exercising a lot, all those bad genes will never get expressed. And you will probably live pretty close to the full lifespan allotted to humans, 120 years. So that's what I'm going for. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Did you ever meet Jim Fix in your early years of training? No, but I did read his book, and I want to tell you, um, I know what he ate the night before he died. Jim Fix, does everybody know who he is? Um, yeah, the complete book of running. It was my Bible. I read it. Uh, he didn't do what he should as far as diet was concerned, although he thought he ate a healthy diet, but it was, again, it was a chicken and fish. Yeah, he, seafood was his main dish. Uh, Kenneth Cooper, by the way, oh, let me Kenneth Cooper, I told you about him in the beginning. Uh, when I finished the manuscript for A Race for Life, I ran it by him. I said, I want you to read this because you are the man who got me started running way back in 1968 and I would love your endorsement of this book. He read through the manuscript. I gave it to him on a Friday. Monday morning, the telephone rings, 8.30. I'll never forget it. So this is Kenneth Cooper. I thought, oh, that's like Jim Fix, you know, the same, oh my God. He said, I just finished reading this manuscript. I can't believe what I just read. And how, where do you get your protein? He honestly <laughs> said that. And then he said, and I don't see where you get your calcium. He said, I want, and I've never heard of a woman with cancer that old, that age, he said, doing an iron, it's a bunch of Iron Mans. He said, will you come to the Dallas, the Cooper Clinic? He said, I want to run every medical test in the book on you and see what condition your condition is in. So he told me about um, Jim Fix at the time. He said, I got Jim Fix in, but I could not get him on the treadmill. He, he may have, he just kept making excuses. I jumped on the treadmill. I said, yes, test me. Uh, he said, I want you to set a world record in fitness for your age group. And he chuckled. He said, I bet you can do it. I said, oh, give me the chance. So the week before, I was doing the Tulsa 15K, and it was world champion, or state, national championship. So I was going all out for that. I got it, got on a plane, flew to Dallas, and he said, you, you have to rest. You're supposed to not do a race just before you're being tested to set a new world fitness record. I said, I'm, I'm all recovered, and that's the vegan diet. But he still, to this day, does not believe that a vegan diet is as powerful as it is, that you still are deficient. He's got a staff of dietitians who tell him that you cannot get enough protein and calcium in your diet because this is what the dietitians are taught. You know, the materials are given to them by the meat and dairy industry. So um, 
and we finish that story, he puts me on the treadmill and he says, okay, 26 minutes is what you have to beat to set a new world record. And so I'm running, it's the bulky protocol, if any of you know what that is. It starts out slow and f flat and it goes <laughs> faster and faster and steeper and steeper until pretty soon it, it's going to win. There's no question. Nobody has <laughs> ever beat that, much, that treadmill. So I'm going along and at one point he says, okay, you just passed, and he's got me wired for everything, you know, blood pressure, heart rate, and he says, you've just passed the male age 30 superior fitness category. I go, all <laughs> right, <laughs> here I am in my 50s. And then kept going and he says, okay, how are you doing? Fine, fine. And I thought, I can go forever. Well, that didn't last long. <laughs> because all of a sudden I'm starting to breathe very hard and thinking, uh-oh, I got to start running. This, up to this point, you know, I'm, I'm walking fast and, and I, he said, well, don't start running until you absolutely have to because it's going to take a lot more out of you. And I, I said, I can't to keep up with the fast treadmill, so I started running. He said, okay, ten more seconds, nine, eight, seven, down to zero. You did it! You set a new world record! I thought, oh, how neat, how fantastic. And so I had this interview, and actually he had the first interview, as I'm on the table and getting rewired and my recovery rate, which incidentally was very fast, he said, see, I've, she's proven what I've been saying all along, that exercise is extremely important. Not a word about diet, you know, <laughs> still. Um, let's see, there are a couple of other things I wanted to tell you. Oh. Yeah, what? On the issue of calcium, have you had any calcium bo uh, bone, bone density. Um, oh, I know one thing. Uh, Lantern Books has set up a whole bunch of radio interviews, and Monday I did two of them. And one of them, this woman, the announcer, was setting my introduction, and she says, and Dr. Ruth has the resting heart rate of a 44-year-old woman. <laughs> and I'm going, you know, I'm on the phone, what? what? And then I realized, she had read that my resting heart rate is 44. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I couldn't correct her because I was, you know, she was doing the introduction, I wasn't a live mic yet, and then I forgot, once the interview got rolling, the resting heart rate of a 44-year-old woman. I thought, oh my God. Yeah, so, ignorance, you know, all over the place. Um, and, I, you know, the 44 resting heart beats per minute is that of a pretty good athlete, especially female, which normally run higher. Um, what you asked me, the bone density, I've, because my mother and both grandmothers, father and mother, genetic factor again, had osteoporosis, and I was sure, giving up dairy, that I was going to get osteoporosis, Dr. McDougall laughed. He said, with all your running, he said, you are not going to have to worry about osteoporosis. Just to be sure, I went and had a bone density test. Now. Um, well, I won't bother writing. 411 is the average 30-year-old female at peak bone density, 411. I came out at 444, obviously way above. And here I am at 50 years of age. Um, and I, but then, in fact, Dr. McDougall said, see, I told you, you had nothing to worry about. But I was just going into menopause. And we all know what happens at menopause, your bone density goes down like that, right? So I had a bone density the next, actually I waited, I think it was two years, and it was, in the meantime, I was doing all these Ironman triathlons, and it had gone up to 466. So it was going up through my 50s. And Dr. Shintani, who's my co-host on the radio show Nutrition and You in Hawaii, said, an MD said, this has never been, this never happened before. We've got to write this up for a medical journal. This is so unusual. Mm -hmm. And I said, it's my running, a lot of running, you know, mm -hmm. three marathons in three weeks. And uh, I did four Ironman triathlons in 11 months. That's, you know, that's heavy duty exercise. So that's going to build strong bones. And that's what you need with no animal protein to leach the calcium from your bones. So I get plenty of calcium from my leafy greens. How about the cartilage in your knees? The cartilage is holding up fairly well. Uh, there has been some de degeneration. Unfortunately, I didn't test that before age 47. Um, I had one problem. I've had accidents. There's been no question about that. I've been hit by 
trucks twice while bicycling. I have a titanium rod in this leg, this big, that diameter. Um, but I was back to running when the doctor said I'd never run again. Um, um, in terms of the cartilage, I've had had a torn cartilage. I was running, I, I've had some really good luck. I can tell you all my bad luck. <laughs> I was running along, minding my own business. All of a sudden, I come to a curb and I'm crossing the street. Get one third of the intersection, I see a skateboard come flying like this. The next thing I know, guy lands both hands on my back and we both go down, he on top of me. This is a six footer, uh, mm -hmm. probably 18 years old and 200 pounds and I tore the cartilage on my knee, so. Um, I recovered, <laughs> back, back to, to running. Okay, I think we're out of time. <laughs> thank you so much, and thank you, Bradley.